Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. He broke through the multi commodity flow barrier. Please, John. Um, yeah, so I, I think for uh, how many, so how many here were at the, the theory lunch when I was interviewing? Oh, okay, good. So it is, it is a different audience. Okay, so. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so. so It'll be, it's mostly the same, but I've added some more details, so hopefully uh, if something wasn't clear then, it'll be clearer now. Okay, so uh, the problem we're going to consider is uh, this problem, the balance separator problem. So we're given a graph, and we want to cut it up into two pieces, but not too many edges cross. Uh, okay, that's great. We just take the min cut. Okay, uh, not quite. We, we also want it to be, we want it to be, uh, you know, we don't want to just cut off one vertex. We want to cut it into two balance pieces. Uh, and add, just adding this balance constraint takes you from easy, as in min cut, to uh, NP hard. Okay, so we can't actually uh, compute the, the best balance cut, so we're going to settle for some kind of approximation. Okay, so uh, in terms of the, the previous work on this, um, so in, in 2004, uh, Aurora and Vazirani showed that you could, they, so they, they presented an algorithm that rounds an STP relaxation of this problem. Uh, and achieves a square root log n approximation. Uh, so then, shortly after that, there, there were a few questions. So one, uh, okay, so, so the main question after that was, okay, we have this algorithm that uh, solves an STP and then rounds it. Can we actually get some kind of practical algorithm? And this is because using black box STP solvers for large problems is typically not very practical. Um, and so in that line of work, um, <coughs> so, uh, or Hazan and Kali show that you could achieve the same approximation factor using multi just multi-commodity flow. Uh, and so then more recently, people have been interested, okay, well, even, even multi-commodity flow is too slow. Can we do even better than that? Um, and that's this other line of work. Uh, these three papers, uh, KRV, Aurora Kali, and uh, the OSVV, um, that finally show you can achieve an, a login approximation but uh, if, you, if you only use single commodity flows. So I have there noted in the bottom. So the, the running time for single commodity flow is basically m to the 3 halves. Running time for multi-commodity flow is n squared. So you get that uh, m to the half factor improvement. Um, oh, and also you can replace, we're going to replace all of the, uh, the m's with n's just because it's a, so it's a standard result. Um, basically, if you have a, a graph, you can always have basically a, a, a n log n edges you can sparsify it to a graph with n log n edges and preserve all the values of the cuts within a constant factor. So if we only care about uh, any kind of problem that, are, that is uh, solving a problem that only depends on the cuts, we can always work with a, a sparsified version. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so to motivate the, the SDP, you start with uh, realizing you can write the actual problem itself uh, as the following quadratic program. So uh, Okay, so we're going to assign either minus one or one to the to the points in the graph, to the vertices in the graph, and uh, so say the set corresponds to the things that are set to minus one. So so clearly we want to so we wanted to minimize the number of edges cut, uh, and so if you look in the objective, each edge cut contributes one to the objective, and our constraint was that uh, we had some balance constraint. So so in that second. Uh, so in the first constraint, that sum is over all pairs x, y, not just the edges. And so this constraint says that uh, <coughs> the cut is balanced. Is there a, the, um, in the score of so, uh, okay, that's a good question. So, so in terms of hardness, um, so assuming unique games, uh, it's a result of uh, Cotton Vishnui that it's hard to approximate to the n constant factor. Um, there are integrality gaps showing that, uh, uh, that uh, the SDP itself can't achieve anything better than log log in. And um, very, so, so uh, in this, the same, so Fox 9, um, for a generalized version of this problem, there was a 
log in to some constant integrality gap. So it, these people think square root login is the right answer, but in terms of hardness, um, very little is known. There's also no for that in the case. <clears throat> Sorry, what? There's some constant uh, approximation lower bound, even without any games. Uh, I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, right, okay, so, so to turn that uh, the quadratic curve into an STP, so we just change, uh, we, re we replace the constraint that um, these were just numbers, either minus one or one, with we, we were going to assign vectors to each of the. Uh, to each of the vertices, and we're going to place them on the sphere. And uh, intuitively, what we want to do now is we want to, what the STP is going to try to do is, is embed the vertices of the graph on the sphere in such a way that, on the one hand, all of the edges in the graph are short, but on the other hand, the points are globally spread out. Uh, okay, so, and uh, we're also going to add this third uh, inequality, the triangle inequality, so we're going to enforce that uh, the square distances between vertices form a metric. So this is kind of a, a weird thing. So just the, if we didn't have these squares everywhere, uh, we would automatically have a metric. But since we can only work with square distances uh, in the STP to have a, something that we can solve, um, we're going to just add this constraint that the square distances form a, form a metric. <clears throat> okay, and so. Uh, the theorem of, of around Vasarani was that so given uh, there's an algorithm that given a solution, an STP solution, we'll round it to uh, a cut within a factor of a balanced cut within a factor of uh, square root log n. Okay, so what if we if we don't want to solve the STP using a, a black box? We want to do something fast. So essentially, the problem of, of uh, solve of um, <coughs> speeding up. Uh, these STP solvers is to not use a black box STP solver, but impl implement our own basically separation oracle. So, so basically the problem that we need to solve is given a supposed candidate solution, which is just going to be an embedding, basically check that it satisfies the constraints. And if it doesn't, point out one that it doesn't, that it doesn't satisfy. Okay, so, uh, so these first two are relatively easy. So, okay, so the second one, Clearly, you can check that in uh, linear time. The first one, I guess, naively would, would require n squared time, but you can uh, essentially observe that. Uh, so on the left, right, so if you, if you, the sum of the distances between all pairs of points is n times the sum of the squares of the distances from the mean. That's just like the variance. Uh, you, know, you can look at the variance as. Uh, the average distance from the mean, or as if you take two random points, the distance from each other. So, so if, you, if you can compute that, uh, the value on the, on the left of the first constraint in linear time. <clears throat> okay, so the problem is the, these triangle inequalities. Um, so there's, there's n cubed of them, so if you were to just do an IEV, it would take n cubed time. Okay, so, so we'll change this a little bit. So instead of the triangle inequality, let's have for every path in the graph G, uh, so this is even so this is implied by the triangle inequality, but, but just to write it explicitly. Um, so, so again, so these distances form a metric. So for every path, uh, the distance between the endpoints is at most the sum of the the distances along the, the path. Because okay, so it seems like it makes things only even harder. But actually, you can you can check this. Uh, using all pairs shortest path, and the idea is just you set the length of an edge to be you know, what, what, this, what this metric thinks the distance should be, and then you compute all pairs shortest paths, and uh, you know, the distances should not have gotten any shorter. If they got shorter, then something was wrong. Right? If, they, if they got shorter after computing all pairs shortest path, then it means uh, it was able to find a path that, that shrunk that distance, which is a contradiction. Okay, so, so this is what leads to the n squared time. Uh, and this is essentially the idea behind. Kind of, so you can think of, uh, kind of, so all pairs shortest path is like multi commodity is like a simple version of multi commodity flow, where multi commodity flow is all pairs shortest path with a uh, small width. And so what we're going to try to do is uh, do use single source shortest paths, so, or uh, that's where the max the max flow comes in. So you can kind of the, think of 
single source shortest path as to max flow is the same as uh, all pair shortest path is to multi-commodity flow. Okay, so basically the question, how can we break the multi-commodity flow barrier is the same as how can we break the all pair shortest path barrier here? Okay, so, uh, so to start, um, so we realize there's, uh, <clears throat> so ARV have this theorem, they have this theorem in their, in their paper, so they should they give an algorithm and they, they give some analysis that shows it's correct. So if we just look at the statement of the theorem and we reword it, uh, it says, so if, if, if we run their algorithm and it doesn't find a, uh, a good cut, then the SDP solution is infeasible. So this means that somewhere inside the proof of their theorem that proves the correctness of their algorithm is a separation oracle. So, what, 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 separation oracle is just, uh, so, uh, is, is what we're trying to find. So a separation oracle is given candidate solution uh, find a, either say, okay, it's all good, or uh, find a violated constraint. Actually, uh, we never even need to say, okay, it's all good. What we're gonna, what we're gonna do is take the candidate solution and we're just gonna try to round it. And if we can round it, even though it's not feasible, I mean, we don't care. We were able to round it. Uh, if we're not able to round it, then we need to do something. And in that case, we need to point out why we couldn't round it, in particular, point out some violated constraint. Right, so, so the problem that we want to solve is we want to implement a separation oracle, meaning we want to, given such an embedding, find a violation of the triangle inequality. Right? We said the other constraints are, are pretty easy. Okay, so, so this observation is that there, well, there's a non-trivial separation oracle buried somewhere in the proof of this theorem. And so we can ask, okay, great, so we have this algorithm. Uh, so how fast is it? And uh, no, we can't even quite go there yet because you know, it's a, the, the proof of their theorem is, is quite non-constructive. Um, so, like, you can run the algorithm in your brain while you read the paper, but uh, it would not be clear at all how to take that out, take the algorithm and you know, run it on, on a machine. Um, so, so what we need to do is basically fix those problems. That's, so the main idea, though, is uh, this algorithm that uh, I'm going to, to, to explain is was kind of already there in uh, the work of ARV, but just very implicit. I mean, it, it was there as a, as a mathematical algorithm, as a proof technique. And uh, what this work does is by, make, we should, by making that algorithm explicit, we actually get a much, fa much faster algorithm for the problem. <clears throat> okay, so, so we turn their theorem into uh, the following. So basically, we get a separation oracle. So given a candidate SDP solution, we can either round it or find a violated constraint. Okay, so, and so for the rest of the talk, um, we we'll talk about the rounding procedure, um, which depends on this version of the this, uh, structure theorem, which is the, the main technical part of their, of their work. And I'm gonna talk about so the version in this work, uh, the algorithmic version. Okay, so the main, the main, so, so where do these things start off? Okay, so, wh so why did we even bother to uh, consider this SDP? Well, the nice thing that the, uh, the thing that the SDP does for us is that kind of it lets us work with geometric objects. So in fact, what the SDP is going to, is going to allow us to do is to, uh, reduce the problem of finding one of these sparse balance cuts in a graph to the following problem. Given some metric space, a particular metric space that has this, this property that the, the distances are squared Euclidean, squared Euclidean distances, find two big sets that are far apart. So this seems like uh, it might be easier because, I mean, there's pictures. Pictures make things, make things easier. There's, for, for finding sparse cuts in a graph, it's kind of hard to work with a picture, but for, for this, it's, uh, it's very easy. So in particular, if we could do the following, given our, uh, our embedding, find two sets that are large and spread, uh, far apart, meaning the minimal distance between point in one set and the uh, point in the other is, is a written some value, 
then you can easily turn it into a cut in the, uh, in the graph. Um, and this is what, this is basically what having a metric gives you. So intuitively, if you, if you, you have these two big separated sets, what you want to do to find a cut is just pick a, a random distance in between. You're going to pick some random radius that's less than whatever the distance is, and you're just going to cut the points right there. Uh, so, so the resulting cut is certainly going to be uh, balanced because the, it's certainly going to include uh, each, those two pieces on each side. The only question is what do you do with the, the ones in the middle? And choosing a random radius basically averages out the, the contribution. So the probability that a particular edge is cut is bounded by its contribution to the SDP uh, divided by you know, whatever that distance is. So, so the, the further apart you can, the farther, the, the farther apart these two sets are, the better approximation that you get. So the approximation factor is determined by how far apart can you find these two large sets. <clears throat> so we're going to aim for delta to be 1 over square root log n to get a square root log n approximation. Okay, so, so this is the ARV rounding procedure. Okay, so, so here's how the ARV do it. Um, so they're going to, they want it right, so they want to find these two separated sets. Well, here's a natural way to, to start. <clears throat> so pick u to be some uh, multivariate standard normal. So this just means that each of the coordinates are, are independent uh, <coughs> standard normals. Uh, and now look at the projection of all of the points in the embedding along this particular vector. And, sorry? How many coordinates? Uh, so it doesn't really matter for now, but it's going to be using Johnson, Linden, Strauss, log n. The dimension, you can assume the dimension is like log n. So I mean, we had some embedding. Uh, the embedding, well, so if you, if you don't care about speed, uh, you, can only, you, can reduce to, uh, you can reduce the dimension to, to log n using Johnson, Linden, Strauss. But uh, the embedding is, to start with, is going to have dimension log n. <coughs> is that answer your question? So to, start, so, um, so to start with, it's going to have dimension log n. I mean, so, so these vectors come from uh, this, this matrix multiplicative of weights method. And you never actually construct the, uh, you never actually construct these things explicitly. Um, yeah, so, so don't worry so much about the, the dimension. The dimension doesn't matter. It's log n. Uh, I mean, the only, the only place the dimension matters is in the speed in that, you know, if you want to, when I, I said the computing distance, I was saying takes like constant time. It takes like log n time. Give me the distance between two points. <coughs> okay, so, so back to here. So we have these, uh, we want to find these separated sets. So the natural idea is to pick a random fat hyperplane. So in other words, pick one of these vectors. Uh, you project the points along them. And now cons to start with, let's consider this, the set of points that have projection at least one and a set of points that have projection less than negative one. Uh, okay, so. Yeah. On the sphere. So that's. Right, so, so a candidate SDP, so we have a candidate SDP solution. So what that means is that we have an embedding of the vertices onto the sphere. So. I mean, it's the same dimension as, it's just the dimension of the point set. I mean, think of it as log n. Right, so we have an embedding and, okay. Okay, so, uh, so right, this means that we have these two points and they're separated by this fat Gaussian hyperplane. Okay, so it seems like the, we're off to a good start. Um, so then what they do is they just say, okay, well, this is a start. And uh, they're, maybe they're not well separated, so we're just going to make them well separated. So in particular, as long as it's a pair of points, one in uh, one set and one in the other, where their distance is less than what we want it to be, we're just going to throw them away. So this is great, because uh, now when we're done, the two sets are certainly separated by delta. Uh, but there's a problem that we might have thrown away all of the points. So. So uh, if we want to say that this finds two large separated sets, you need to, to say, well, this doesn't throw away all of the points. OK, so, okay, so, so let's imagine, so we, we had this algorithm, right? So, so we, okay, and the, the big picture here is we were given this embedding, and we're going to try to round it to a cut. 
So we want to either round it to a cut or find a violated constraint in the SDP. So what we're going to do is we will try, uh, so we'll try a bunch of these different directions and apply this uh, procedure. So we'll pick a bunch of these random vectors u, try this thing. You know, hopefully it works. When it, but by, by works, I say it uh, doesn't throw away too many points. And if it ever works, then, then we're great. Okay, but, uh, okay, so what happens if it doesn't work? Well, if it doesn't work, then that means that, uh, so let's, let's say for each direction, u, let's let m of u just be that matching that we constructed. So, so that algorithm set find uh, is in, is like, you can think of it as an oracle that implements this, uh, this m of u. <coughs> okay, so m of u is, is just the matching returned by set find of u if it fails. Okay, so, and uh, it's gonna have the following properties. Okay, so first, you know, we said, uh, so all of the edges in M of U were, uh, were between points that, had, uh, that were separated by this fat hyperplane. In particular, the difference in projection was at least two. So, okay, uh, that's the first property. The second property is we have this symmetric property where, uh, so, so, I mean, we can imagine that set find does the same thing if I pick U or if I pick minus U, just by, by symmetry. I'll just imagine it does the same thing. Um, and so, I'm actually going to associate a direction with these matchings. In particular, I'll assume the direction is uh, the edges are directed from you know, smaller projection to a larger projection. In that case, the symmetry condition is a skew symmetry condition. Okay, and finally, the largeness. largeness. So we said uh, that we try this for a bunch of different directions. If it were the case that, uh, that we succeeded, meaning such a matching did not exist for a constant fraction of directions, then we would have, then uh, we, did, we did our sampling, Log n times, we would have found it. The matching is the fair point to remove yeah. distance smaller than yeah. the So the matching is exactly these green lines. So these are the points that we removed, the pairs of points that we removed in this procedure. <clears throat> and uh, we want to say that on average, so if we failed, we on average must have removed many of them. <clears throat> okay, so. This, this object is a matching cover. So, okay, so, so again, so matching cover is just this collection of matchings, one for each uh, direction that has these three properties. So, and, it's, uh, and where they came from was the, the rounding over them. Okay, so they have this theorem that says, okay, whenever you have such, uh, such an object, so uh, it can be helpful to think about, so on the one, uh, matching cover in two ways. One, you have this, uh, collection of matchings. Two is now just look at, ignore the, the directions, and now just uh, look at the union over all directions of, the, of the, those matchings. This just gives you a graph, which is a, a union of these you know, infinitely, many, infinitely many matchings. And their theorem is the following. Whenever you have uh, this collection, such a collection of matchings, now look at this, this graph formed by the union of all of them. Then there's a pair of, uh, of vertices in this graph that are uh, far away in the embedding. So, uh, so in, in globally in, in, in this uh, embedding space, they're a constant distance apart. And they're, but their distance in the, this graph that's formed by the union of all the matchings is only square root log n. Okay, so, so what does this mean? So why is this helpful? Well, okay, so remember we said that we, all, of the match, all of the edges in this matching had the property that the distance between the endpoints was less than one over square root log n, right? The, that was what we were aiming for. Uh, <clears throat> so this theorem says that there's a pair of points that are constant distance away, uh, and there's a path in this union graph uh, that's only square root log n edges. So this is a contradiction to the triangle inequality. Right? Because their, their actual distance in the embedding is a constant. And we're saying there's a, there's a, pat, there's a, a sequence of length square root log n where along that path, each, the, the distance is less than 1 over square root log n. So you know, if you're just a con the constants properly, you, there's a contradiction. Which delta inequality is what? You see, if the delta inequality holds, which one is that? Length for oh, triangle. Uh, oh, oh, actually, yes. <laughs> this is bad. Yes, yeah. so if the triangle, right? So, 
Right, so, you, so you've, uh, you've uh, yeah, so basically what it is, so if the triangle inequality, if the triangle inequality holds, then uh, any path connecting two points of distance L it must contain an edge of length L over R, and this is the contradiction. Okay, so, so, so this is where the meat of the separation oracle in the ARV theorem is, right? I mean, it's right here. This is, this is exactly what it's saying. The, uh, if, if, this, if the rounding procedure failed, there's a violation of the triangle inequality, and here it is. In particular, it's, the violation is of this form. There will be, there's a way that you can chain together R of these uh, matchings in order to find a, a violation. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is nice. So, so, this, so now we know, okay, so we sort of know how to find them. We just know, we know that if we could, if we could actually look at this graph consisting of the union, uh, then you know, the violation would still be there. It doesn't seem, it doesn't really seem to be much easier because you know, finding a violation in the union graph, all we know is that uh, you know, the violation will be of length square root log n, but that doesn't really help us if this graph has large degree or... Okay, so, so how is... You need to find what is the exact triple where the triangle... Yeah, exactly. So, so we want to find, what we want to find is the, the exact, you know, the triple or the, the path. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so, so just to recap, right? So, so again, so we started with the embedding. We tried to round it in the following way. We picked this fat uh, hyperplane. We assumed, we said, okay, this is a good start. Then we said, okay, well, uh, maybe there's, uh, you know, we, need to, we need to make sure that these two sets are well separated. So we, we match the points that were close together and we threw them away. And uh, we're saying, okay, this didn't, this didn't work. We threw away too many points. So then we have many, for each direction, we have many of these matchings. And now the structure theorem for IRB says that it uh, gives us this contradiction. Okay, so, so here's the main, so the main result is uh, essentially but constructive sense of this version of this theorem, right? So this, this theorem says, again, so you have th there's these two points, uh, x and y, that are constant distance apart, and then there's a, there's a sequence of directions, so that if you look at the the matchings for each for those directions, uh, there's a path connecting these two endpoints. <clears throat> okay. So there's an algorithm. So so basically, the algorithmic version is we can we can actually find this chain. In particular, there's a distribution over lists of vector of Gaussian vectors, so that if we sample from uh, R vectors from this list, then, uh, in fact, there will be, and okay, so we're going to sample R vectors from this list, and we're just going to look at paths uh, in, so paths in the the the, the union of these uh, matchings, but uh, not, not all paths, in particular, a very specific set of paths, just, just the paths where the first edge is in the first matching, the second edge is in the second matching, the third edge is in the third matching, and so on. So this is, right, so, so, okay, so, so if we sample uh, these vectors and we look at these paths, then many of these paths will be exactly the ones we want. So in particular, you know, say so, so so if you don't worry so much about the, the epsilon, uh, so if you, you know, take epsilon to be some constant, then it, it says at least on average there, there's some expected, uh, there's one expected uh, pair where uh, the distance is a constant and uh, along, and so, so the, there's a path from one to the other in, that goes, the, that takes the first edge along matching one, second edge along matching two and so on. Right, so, so, so note that you know, it's easy to find, if, if such a path exists, it's easy to find it, right? I mean, so you can imagine, right, so what do you do? So you get the first matching, uh, you, you keep that. Now you get the second matching, and you look at, uh, you know, so some of the vertices that were, uh, some of the vertices that were mat that had an in edge in the first matching won't have any out edge in the second matching. So you just throw those away. Those those die. You say you can think of it as of the, as those paths dying off, and now so so, but now you just look at those. So now those points that had an in edge in the first matching and an out edge in the second matching, you just concatenate these paths and you, you keep track of this until you get to the end. And this is saying, one you'll get to the end, 
as and you'll be able to, when you concatenate the path in this, in the, in this way, um, it's not the case that all the vertices die out. And two, the final, the two endpoints at the end will, uh, <coughs> will be far apart. Just taking our uh, IID no. and normal So, yes, yeah, that's, the, that's, uh, that's the trick. So we, that's why, so if you want to just do this, uh, so I, I think, and what, what I know is you know, some people who were working on this before tried to do is, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a natural idea you know, to just, can you somehow randomly sample from this M and then just look for the paths in there? Um, it's, that, that will not work. Um, okay. And thank you. Just design, what do you mean by end zone if there's some expected pairs? Uh, I mean, if you define just one? a random yeah. variable. Yeah, okay, so, so, Previously, so basic, yeah, so, so. So actually this generalizes the above theorem in two different ways. Um, one is the algorithmic version. Two is, uh, so what you can actually do is replace, for any epsilon, you can replace L with, uh, so there it's omega one, you can replace it with epsilon and R with uh, square root epsilon log n. Now in their setting, there's no reason to do that. In our, in our setting, there is a reason to do that because uh, basically, so this is, that's gonna give you a worse approximation. That's gonna give you a square root epsilon Sorry, a square root log in over epsilon approximation. Uh, but it's going to give you if, you, if you're willing to take epsilon uh, smaller, you get more pairs. This is answer the one out of the n squared. No, out of the, well, out of, I mean, there's at most n, uh, right? There's at most n of these chains that could possibly live, right? Because the, they all, I mean, the match, there's only n edges in the matching, and all of these chains has to start with an edge in the first matching. Right, so, 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 uh, right, so again, I mean, the, it's very easy to find these paths because it's not just that you're looking in the union of these graphs, it's these specific paths where the, the first edge is along the first matching, second one, and so on. Okay, so, so now that we have, so with this theorem, now basically the problem becomes pretty easy. So to implement a separation oracle for, uh, <laughs> for the SDP, um, right, so like I said before, we just, we're gonna pick a bunch of random mu and uh, hopefully it'll work. And if it doesn't work, now we're not just gonna pick independent random mu, we're gonna choose according to this distribution. And now we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing, but for these carefully chosen mu sampled from this distribution, and then we're going to look for a violated constraint consisting of these paths, and the, the structure of the theorem is going to guarantee this is going to work, right? And so, uh, so the actual algorithm is a little more complicated than this. You, know, you need to. It turns out, if you actually want a fast algorithm, you need to not just implement a separation oracle. You need to implement a, a, a separation oracle of small width, which basically means. Uh, so what, basically, what's going on here is uh, you have this cut problem, and its dual is uh, a flow problem. And so what you're actually doing by implementing the separation oracle is you're coming up with a, uh, a dual solution that, that's like a good, if you think of uh, one of these things as a two-player zero-sum game, you're thinking of, uh, of um, one player is playing this embedding and you're coming up with a good response to this embedding which consists of a path. Um, and so, so if you actually wanna solve this, this program quickly, you need to not just find, uh, not, you need to not just come up with a, uh, a good, something that's a good response to the embedding, but something that's all, a good response to the embedding and also uh, like a good strategy for the dual player overall. But, okay, so these things don't matter, but there's, there's a bunch of details. So that's where, that's where uh, so I haven't talked about flows at all and I'm not going to, but where the flows come in is essentially the fact that, so we need to not just find one path violating the constraint, we need to find many paths, and furthermore, we need to find many paths that we can simultaneously flow in the graph. So that's where the flow comes in. Why okay. do you need to find because, uh, I mean, okay, intuitively, if all we were to do is you know, point out a single violated constraint, we're not gonna make very much progress. So, so I mean, so what's going on is we, there's this, we're thinking of it as this game where uh, there's this player playing an embedding 
and we're playing a path, and our payoff is uh, the distance between the endpoints and the, the endpoints of the path. And so what's going to happen is now the, the, the embedding player is going to look at what, at what we did and to say, okay, I need to, uh, I need to come up with a better strategy. I'm going to fix my embedding so that you know, what, you, what you did is no longer as good. And what essentially what that's going to mean is that uh, the path, it's going to, he's going to take the endpoints of the path and squish them together. So if you're only giving one path, he's on, uh, the update is only making, you know, it's not doing very much. It's, it's taking two points and squishing them together, which isn't very, making very, many, very much progress. So essentially by, by finding many of these paths that you can pack simultaneously in, in, the, in the graph, you're ensuring that when these updates happen, they're, ac they're actually going to be doing a lot. They're gonna be, it's going to be simultaneously squishing many of the points together. <clears throat> okay, so, so, okay, so to start with, we're just going to look at the, the argument of, of ARV. And in fact, the, the argument that you need for the, for the algorithmic version is basically requires you know, some, some modifications to this, but you can keep all of the structure of the argument there and just go piece by piece replace what needs to be replaced. But, uh, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to present the, the argument of ARV, or a sketch of it, um, but I'm going to try to present it the way I think about it, which led to uh, the algorithmic version, which is as, as an algorithm. So the proof is really is, really is an algorithm. Okay, so, so we want to prove this theorem. So it needs to, somehow the proof needs to, to find a path between points that are far away. So implicitly, the way it does this is it has an algorithm that... Uh, finds points that are far away. So in particular, that starting from some vertex tries to walk as far away from that vertex as possible. So it tries to walk in this matching graph as far away from the original vertex in the embedding. Right? So, so it wants to walk. So it's doing the walk in the matching graph. And when I say far away, it wants to ultimately end up far away in the embedding. Okay, and the algorithm is an extremely natural one. It's just... Uh, uh, you start, you're at some vertex, so you pick a direction and you try to walk as far along it as you can. So, in particular, the, so this first part of the proof is, is the following. So if, if there was some way that you could walk along a sequence of matching edges such that uh, the directions U1 through UR were all very close together, then you would actually f walk far away globally. So this essentially means so, the, so in other words, so I, I start at this red vertex, I uh, pick a random direction, and I, and I walk one step. Okay, so, so these things are matching, so I can't keep walking in the same direction. But maybe there's a way, there's some U2 that's very, very close. And intuitively, if, if I pick a direction that's very, very close and I walk along it, I should actually get further away globally. And repeat, repeat, repeat. So, so there's basically two parts to, to the argument. So, so one is if you can find this, the sequence of... Uh, of directions that are very close together and for which the, you have a chain like this, then walking along the sequence actually makes you walk far away. That's part one. Did, yep. Didn't you say the sequence of directions is fixed in advance? Like you assume a given sequence of the, for the projections and then it works no matter what that is? Or no, you actually... No, I just sampled from... So in which version? So I thought, okay, I thought you take a sequence, essentially take a sequence of samples and right. you can make a guarantee for the sequence in that order. Uh, I mean, so it's not a, it's not a guarantee. It's, uh, it's, so you sample from a list of oh, these vectors. Oh, okay. I see. And right, so the, that expectation, so I said the expected number of uh, chains that you find was n to the 1 minus epsilon. Right. right so the guarantee, it's, not, no, it's certainly not true that for every such yeah. one. Yeah. Um, okay, and the second part is, okay, so the first part is you know, if we could walk along such a, a sequence, and the second part is we can. The first part, so the second part is you know, getting rid of the if, and the second part is, is using measure concentration. Okay so, okay, so the first part. So let's suppose that we had a chain of these close directions. So we have this list of vectors, u1, u2, u3, all the way up to ur, and let's say they're close. So by close, I mean uh, their distance is less than four. Note that these are, are indeed extremely close because two independent random Gaussians are a uh, distance like square root d, right? So, so if they're 
just constant distance that means they're extremely close together. Okay. So the, the, so the, all the U's, the U, wherever you see a U is a Gaussian. Wherever you see a V are the vertices. So these are... Okay, so these are the same. Well, it's in the same space because... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so let's say we had uh, something like this, and let's say the chain does not walk far away. So in particular, every other vertex along this chain... Oh, okay, so just what I mean by this notation, when I have the arrow and the, the M, just means you know, the, the vertex on the left is, is an edge from the vertex on the left to the vertex on the right in M in that direction. <clears throat> so let's, in particular, so let's say that every vertex after, so Z1 all the way up to ZR, they're all very close to Z0. Uh, so the distance is less than one-fourth. Okay, so, so what we can do is we can look at, uh, so we want to, Let's look at the, the difference between Z2 and Z0 in the projection along U2. Okay, so we can write it you know, as, as this uh, sum. Okay, so, so if we look at the thing on the left, we know that Z1 and Z2 uh, form an edge along U2. So we can replace that thing on the left with a 2. Okay, so that's going to... Okay, and the thing on the right can do some more adding and subtracting. So, so we want to say that... Uh, Z1 and, and Z0 are also far apart along U2. We don't know that because the, the direction that they're matched along is U1. You want to say that if the two endpoints are close, you had a lot of uh, distance to UI. Uh, so what, what I'm going to want to say is that uh, at some point, this walk ends up far, walking far away. And so, uh, okay, so, so what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to look at, I'm going to say that uh, these, the projection Along, from Z0 to ZR along UR is going to continue to grow and grow. <clears throat> okay, so, so, okay, so, so, the, right, so the thing on the left I know is at least two because it's a matching edge. The thing on the right I can't immediately say anything about because uh, Z1 and Z0, so if this were, if that were a U1 instead of a U2, then I could also replace that with two, right? So, any, for any two points that are matched along you know, uh, some u, their projection is at least two along that u. But uh, so what we want to do is we want to say, well, even the point is that, uh, okay, so if this, this thing over here were u1 instead of u2, then we could replace it with two. But so what we want to say is that, well, since u1 and u2 are close together, we can basically replace the u2 with the u1 with uh, only a very small loss. Okay, so that's exactly, okay, so the first thing we've thrown away and replaced with 2. The second thing, we've replaced that U2 with the U1, and uh, how much did we lose? That, the thing on the, on the far right is exactly how much we lost. Okay, this, okay, this is great. Now, the, now we have the 2, the thing next to the 2 will also become a 2. And uh, the, thing, the other thing is at most, uh, you know, what you get from Kershi Schwartz. And, uh, okay, so now remember we're assuming the directions u1 and u2 are very close together, and uh, so we're, we're z dot and z dot. So uh, okay, this is, so this means we've now just chained together two matchings, and the projections go have gone up to three. Okay, and uh, repeat this inductively. So uh, and on, on each step, you're going to take two steps forward and one step back, literally. So you, right, so so on the next one you go three. You're gonna add two to get to five, and go back down to four. You get that. Uh, so the projection between uh, ZR and Z0 along UR is at least R plus one. So the projections are gonna keep getting larger and larger. Okay, but but what is all right? So so what does this mean? So right, so we have the following just by a simple inductive argument. Okay, so what could it possibly mean if 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 these projections just keep getting larger and larger. Well, uh, what that would mean is that you had these, eventually you're going to have this, uh, these points that are on the one hand close together, but on the one hand their projection along this particular vector UR is extremely large. Now, uh, so if you look at the, the distribution, so if you have a pair of points and you look at the distribution of their difference along a random Gaussian vector, that's just a Gaussian with uh, variance 
whatever the square distance is. So in particular, the probability that you get some kind of massive stretch, so in particular, the probability that you have uh, some pair of, of points that are constant distance, actually constant distance apart, and uh, the projection is square root log n, is going to be 1 over n to the fourth for a particular pair of points. So we can imagine just, so we, we started with this m, uh, this uh, matching cover m. So we can imagine that just before we did anything, we pruned m and we just, we said, okay, if there's any, look at any u for which any pair of points is stretched by this much and throw away all of the edges along, uh, along those directions. We're only removing very, very little, three, okay, so it's clearly, um, it's still going to satisfy the three conditions where, uh, you know, stretch, skew, symmetry, and largeness. So the, the only problem is, do we, do we still have largeness? The answer is yes, because we haven't thrown away too many. Uh, we haven't thrown away too many. Okay, so, so I start with M of U. Okay, now I start with M. So now I'm going to consider, uh, I'm going to look at any U for which this happens for any pair of points, right? So... Right, so, so, so M of U is, uh, so, so M is this collection of matchings, one for each U. Okay, now, uh, for, each, for each particular pair of vertices, there are some U that are bad in the sense that, uh, that these, two, these two vertices, even though they're close together, their projection along U is huge. They're, they're very, very, they're stretched. However, for each pair of vertices, there's only one over n to the fourth of these u are bad. So if I just do the following, for each pair of uh, vertices, throw away all of the edges along all of the u that are bad. You know, I'm throwing away n squared. So, for, so, so I'm throwing away uh, n squared times n to the fourth. Okay, so, so the total number of uh, u that are bad, right, are n squared times n over n to the fourth. I mean, and, uh, and I've thrown away all of the edges, so there's another factor of n. So I've still only removed like 1 over n of the total degree of this graph. So I've basically done nothing to it. So it, basically you can assume that just this never happens because we can just say, well, we imagine we started with uh, some m. It doesn't have this problem. Okay, but now if we started with that m, the same argument still works. But now this is a contradiction because... We, we fixed up him. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that, uh, well, that proves part one. If we had the sequence of directions, then you have to, if, so if you have this chain along a, se a sequence of, of close directions, then it walks far away. Missing something in the here. For any u, u is a Gaussian variable? Here. Yeah. So for any, this is a value of the Gaussian or one of the... Uh, okay, yeah, so, so the the value, yes, it's the value of the... So m, so you could think of it as I have a uh, m is this function from Gaussian space to matchings. What I'm saying is, so now look at the the vectors u that are bad for any pair. Just throw, just empty the matching frame of u. So you throw away edges, you don't throw away u's. So you can throw m. I mean, so you can think of, uh, so think of m as a random graph, right? It's a random, it's a random uh, matching, though. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's it's an infinite collection. It's an infinite, you know, it's an infinite collection of matchings. It's also a random graph. Uh, parameterized by this continuous distribution. Uh, and I'm saying just we can ignore like these U's that are, that are bad because we can imagine we just threw away, right? So, so um, the edge at the end of this chain, or yeah, there's, there's a point. Uh, when you constructed this chain, right, the, the last edge that you are is the edge that we're saying we had long stretch along. And that was also an edge for which there, sorry, that, uh, this, this direction u r is the one that we had the long stretch along, and uh, this direction was also the one where the last pair of points were matched. 
So if I throw away all of the directions where you have this, this stretch, then there's no points matched along those directions. So you can't, so no edge of the chain can be along such a direction. Okay, so so. Okay, so 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 for each, so just imagine for each uh, vector, real vector, I have uh, <coughs> I have these matching, uh, matching, and now what I'm going to do is just I'm going to look at for a particular vector. If I have this this stretch condition, I'm going to throw away that matching for that vector. Um, the goal here is to find the c1 to ur. So you throw away things. Well, so, 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 this, first of all, this is just, this is the error B part, so there's no, uh, you don't actually need to find them, but, yeah. I mean, all I'm saying is I'm, I'm taking the M I started with, and I am making it smaller, and, I mean, the, the conclusion of the theorem is, uh, is monotone in M. If, if, if some M, if M is a subgraph of some M prime, then the conclusion of the theorem still holds an M prime, so, so, shrinking M only makes the theorem harder to prove, so. Okay, so, okay, so, 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 right, so that was the first part. So the second part is, uh, okay, you want to have a chain of length. So let's say, let's just look at a chain of length two. So we want to find some u1 and u2 that are close together and for, so that we have the, this chain of length two. Okay, so let's, the, the trick and the, the clever part of the argument is uh, looking at these things from the perspective of y. So that's this guy in the middle. So don't look at it from the perspective of the guy at the end, look at it from the perspective of the guy in the middle. And so in particular, so a typical, so we had this largeness condition. So say a typical vertex is matched along half of the directions. And the skew symmetry condition means that uh, of those half of all the directions in Gaussian space that uh, it's matched along, half of them are directions where it's matched in and half of them are directions where it's matched out. So in particular, if I let A be the set of U for which Y is matched out, uh, yeah, so, so I guess maybe, maybe if uh, these bold U's here were actually non-bold because they're instances, maybe this would be... <coughs> so, so A is the set of the outcomes of U for uh, which Y is matched out, and B, which by the skew symmetry is minus A, uh, is set for it's matched in. Then each of these, these are two subsets of Gaussian space, each of measure, and they're antipodal, uh, of measure one quarter. Each, both of them have measure at least one quarter. Okay, now there's this uh, classical result that if you have two sets in, in Gaussian space and they both have large measure, they have to be close together. So this, this is, uh, right, so th okay, this gives us immediately, this gives us exactly what we want, assuming I got the constants right. Yeah, right, so okay, so the, the, we, the good, we wanted to say we had a, a chain of directions where the directions are distance less than four, and uh, right, this gives us exactly what we want. So immediately, there are, there's one, this is the direction in U1 and A, and direction U2 and B, they're distance less than four, and by the definition of A and B, we have this chain. You get that immediately. <coughs> okay, and then the, the hard part is uh, basically repeat this inductively. It's not quite as, as easy to do as the, the previous one, but it's not terribly hard. Okay, so, so, okay, so the algorithm conversion. So what we want to do is we want to turn this into an algorithm. <clears throat> so here's a, a natural way, right? So, so the, the, the sequence of, uh, of vectors that you walked along, that ARV walked along, was the sequence of close directions. So that's why, so, so picking just a bunch of independent vectors doesn't seem like it's going to work if you want to mirror their proof. If you want to the proof, the right thing to do seems to be, well, pick a sequence of highly correlated directions. So pick one direction, and then the next direction is going to be a, a highly correlated copy. <laughs> and the next direction is going to be a highly correlated copy, and so on. So with this, essentially what this means is I'm going to pick the second vector from a small ball around the first vector, the third vector from a small ball around the... And uh, 
you know, we just need to choose, you know, how, what's, what's the size of this ball? Well, you know, we just need to balance these two things. So we need, we need, uh, we need the, this ball to be relatively small if we want to carry out this projection, projection addition argument, right? That's what depended on uh, the distances between the vectors being small. And here it's going to be the expected distance is small. And uh, on the other hand, okay, so, so at the extreme, if we, if we made this ball huge and these were totally independent vectors, uh, then, uh, sorry, sorry, if the ball had radius zero, then we would, then this would be great. Uh, we would easily be able to carry out this projection addition argument, but uh, we would never form a chain because we keep picking the same direction every single time. On the other hand, the other extreme, if we, the, that was the first part. That was the, that was the, that was, the, that was the, the key local, that was how you expanded from a local property to a global property. That if you have this local property that along any particular direction, you were walking far away, then this goes, and this implies this global property that you're actually walking far away globally. Right, so, so if I were to pick the same direction every time, clearly uh, this is perfect. That means I can perfectly carry out the argument with no loss, but uh, this gains me nothing because if I pick the same direction every time, I'm never going to form a chain. At the other extreme, I could pick a sequence of totally independent vectors, and then uh, now this is great. Now these, these events are independent, so the probability of forming a chain is very, very easy to analyze. It's just you know, whatever the probability of... Uh, you know, it's just going to raise it to the, some power. Now, yeah. Um, so now, uh, okay. So, so we need to balance somewhere between these two extremes. So if, <clears throat> so basically to carry out this production addition argument, no matter, so just, just from this, on, uh, by expectation, we're going to lose a factor of uh, one minus, uh, we're going to lose a factor of rho on every step, no matter what. So if we want to have any hope of carrying this up until uh, carrying up this argument until we get a chain of length r, we're going to need to rho to be like, like one minus one over r. Otherwise, we're going to lose more than one on a single on a single step, just due to this correlation. So essentially, this is the, the value that's forced picking, picking rho to be one minus one over r is, is basically forced, and then we just see okay, what can we prove given that we have to do, what can we prove about the probability of forming a chain given that we have this constraint? Okay, and then the projection argument addition uh, project the Projection addition argument becomes a probabilistic one, uh, and just that if you have two points, and it just says if you have two vertices that are close in the embedding, then if, if, if they were far apart, a lot, if they were had a large projection along U R, then they probably have a far a large projection along U R plus one. And basically, the key ingredient to the proof is replacing so this classical result with this uh, much stronger one. So, so the first one says if you have two sets in Gaussian space, then there's two. There's a point in them. There, there's a point in one and a point and a point in the other that are close together. The second one says, in fact, that holds for many of them simultaneously. Uh, in particular, if you pick two correlated two correlated uh, Gaussians, the probability that one, even if they're very highly correlated, there's still a reasonable chance that while one lands in one set, the other lands in the other set if the two sets are big. So, or equivalently, you can think of this as the 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 highly correlated walk still mixes somewhat fast. This is related to mixing. Okay, and so now if you apply this this argument to uh, to just picking you know, two vectors, we got immediately we got a chain of length two with probability one, one over sixteen to the r. And uh, so now, we, so we're going to basically going to lose a constant so constant to the r on each step, and so. Again, you carry out an inductive argument, and uh, you're going to get a chain of length e to the minus uh, r squared. Uh, you're going to get a chain of length r with probably e to the minus r squared. And this is the where those bounds come from. Okay, and so uh, that's you know, most of this was was ARV. Really, just uh, these two things at the end are the, the kind of the key ideas. Um, so can you go back to that one? Yeah. The application of the how you use the muscle. Down here. Right, so, uh, so right, these, the sets A and B are again the same sets. They each have measure a quarter. So now this says when I sample U1 and U2 with probability at least uh, this value, 1 16th to the, to the, one, to the R, because it's, 
uh, I have this property. Um, so this gives me a chain of length too. And then, uh, so the way the actual proof goes is, so now I want to say, so this immediately, this gives me a chain of length too. I want to, now if I want to know, is it a chain of length too where the projection is actually larger than it was before? Uh, I'd start with this probability and I just subtract off the probability that I lost too much from the stretch, which is going to be much smaller than that, in particular less than you know, that over two. So I, I showed the, how you get the chain of length too, uh, not how you know that it's uh, larger, you know that it's larger just by subtracting the probability that it's shrunk, which is not going to be very much. Okay, so, uh, so, okay, so where can this go? Um, so this idea of using, uh, of, of looking inside the proofs of complicated, uh, looking inside complicated proofs to find good algorithms probably, uh, probably exists somewhere else. Um, general, uh, can you apply the same thing to generalized process cut? Um, so this is kind of looking at the, this thing in terms of the noise operator instead of the classical uh, isoparametric inequality, it makes the connection much closer to some of the other recent uses of uh, the noise stability in, in CS, particularly with uh, a lot of the unique aims reductions. So there, you know, maybe this could uh, help in the, the problem. So, so as I said in the beginning, we don't know very much about the, the hardness of of sparse cut, maybe this, it seems like this is be helpful in uh, getting a stronger connection because uh, these kinds of noise stability results are very important for uh, a lot of these unique AMR hardness results. And finally, can we break the single commodity flow barrier? So the last one is what I've been thinking about mostly since, uh, since doing this work. Um, I have some partial, uh, partial results, but it uh, seems like a, like a tough problem. Thank you.